and welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And we are in the middle of our series on Christology after taking a two-episode break to hang out with our friend Matt Whitman and our other friend, Will Whedon. We have friends. <laughs> two. <laughs> two. Two friends. of them, Kevin. Yeah. We don't count as each other's friends. No. We, yeah, it's, no. it's the other ones. So today we're going to talk about Hebrews 1 because we were doing a Bible study on that on Friday and I was like, hey, I think this is a Christological passage. I think every passage is a Christological passage. Do you think everything's about theology, Kevin? I do. See, I told you I was going to start the episode with that. (laughs) Everything. (laughs) But that's actually because it is. That's the reality of our life. One day, everything will be about theology. And you know what you call that? Heaven. Heaven. Paradise. Bliss. (laughs) So, you know, just a suggestion. Especially if you take the maxim of all theology as Christology, then even more so, it it works. Just always. It's good stuff. There you go. I can't wait. (laughs) So I'm going to go ahead and start reading our passage that we're going to talk about today. Because you like it when we go straight to like, let's actually talk about the Bible. Well, there's an idea. Yeah, yeah. I like to say lots of silly things before that that make no sense. Read. (laughs) What? You don't want me to... Read. (laughs) All right, Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Shall I keep going or is that a good good pausing point there? Because now we're getting into like little inset words and stuff that seem to be quoting or or poetry or something or other. So this is usually considered the prologue to the book of Hebrews. Um, Part of the problem of the book of Hebrews is nobody knows what to do with it. As, as we know and we've talked about before, um, the author of the book of Hebrews is, is not given in the text. Mm-hmm. And therefore, um, we don't have a definitive authorship given. Uh, the early church liked to ascribe the book to Paul at various times and in various ways. <laughs> um, but even that was kind of an interesting description so we, we do have the book quoted very early on like in 96 AD so we know it's an early text so it's not some kind of book that was written like after the New Testament or something we don't right. so we know that the book was around before uh, the end of the first century it's a contemporary of our other of New, New Testament, Testament writings, writings right yeah. so so date wise there's not a problem with being Pauline or some other apostle no problem at all but the problem is the Greek and Hebrew, Hmm, isn't that funny? <laughs> the Greek in Hebrews, meaning when this was originally written in Greek, the Greek that was used is is some of the best, and some people would say the best Greek in the New Testament, meaning the most well-written Greek. Hmm. So sentence structure, euphemy, uh, rhythm, um, allusions, alliterations, all the, the rhetorical devices you can think of, um, they're prevalent in Hebrews, and they're well well done. So hmm. the author knew what he was doing. And so for this reason, um, it's, it's quite different than Paul's letters. Uh, some people would say Paul's Greek is a very pragmatic Greek. He uses a language to accomplish what he's trying to accomplish, but he's not spending a lot of time trying to be eloquent. In Let the me way find the writes. right turn of phrase yeah. or a beautiful way to say now, this. Now, Paul yeah. does use paranomasia. He what? uses... Uh, that's a big fancy word for wordplay. Okay, yeah. I was like, okay. I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> so he, Paul will play with the sounds of words as he writes, and he'll use certain sounds over and over in certain paragraphs or in certain um, sections of his writing. And that's and that's fun. We can talk about this another time. But he's not known for being the best writer of Greek. And that's fine because he's not a native Greek speaker, right? Yeah, he, he's a he Hebrew of Hebrews. Hebrews, all right. He speaks Hebrew. So, but the author of the Hebrews seems to be a really good writer of Greek. And so one of the earliest theories of this book is that it was written by Paul in Hebrew, 
but translated into Greek by Luke, who is the author of the New Testament books, Luke and Acts, right? Now, does the Greek and Luke and Acts match up with this nice Not Greek? Not quite as well, but but there are a lot of similarities, especially between Acts and Hebrews. Okay. Um, so there there is some, okay, maybe, there's evidence. There's some overlap. Yeah, there's yeah. some evidence that would point that direction. But the, the authorship is in question throughout the history of the church. Um, Pauline authorship... Definitely is the most prevalent explanation, but it's certainly not the not fully accepted by the church. And that's fine. We don't really care. Yep. Um, but that's just kind of the way it goes. But um, as we look at this book and try to categorize it, the reason I bring all that up is because Paul's books in the New Testament are all letters, right? So if mm-hmm. you think of Paul's writing, you have the book of Romans, through the book of Philemon. All those books are written by Paul. Those are the Pauline epistles. An epistle means letter. It so says, they, I'm Paul, and I'm writing yeah, to I'm you. Paul, and I'm writing this letter. This, yeah. And he has a closing on it, right? Yeah. Well, this letter is lacking a Pauline b- beginning. It doesn't say, I, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, write to you, Jewish Christians scattered right. throughout the world, something like that, right? Um, but it does have an ending. It has an epistolatory ending. So the reason I bring this up is is when you start the book of Hebrews, it doesn't start off like an epistle. It starts starts off more like a gospel, which have prologues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay? And this is kind of the issue, is that in the book of Hebrews, we don't start off with an address. We start off with this really beautifully written theological statement, which is very reminiscent, at least in my mind, of the gospel of John, where we have this extremely um, important and Christocentric prologue that leads you into the book. Hmm. It's it's some of the best written Greek. Um, and I really think in the Gospel of John, too, even though the Greek is simple, the, the prologue, especially verses 1 through 5, are really beautifully constructed, so much so that, that secular people still quote it today. I mean, it still is, hmm. a, is kind of a... <laughs> a unique opening that people quote. Well, the book of Hebrews has that kind of good opening, right? John 1, Hebrews 1, very similar in style, um, meaning Christological style, and also in in beauty. So, okay, But what I want to know before we get too far in is, as I was reading verse 1, long ago in many times various ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. How many of you listeners said the next part? Yeah, As I was saying exactly. it. <laughs> now, some of you might be discovered. This is the first podcast you've listened to episode after discovering us because of our episode with Matt Whitman. So you might be a little confused by what what does that mean? But if you are a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod member and you go to one of our churches, you may hear this right before the sermon is preached. Is that where it is when the sermon is preached? I'm trying to remember where this happens in the service. The it's pastor usually before, will get up. It's after the readings are concluded. Yeah. And be, so usually before the sermon, this is the address to the congregation. In many, many various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Right. So I can just like That's kind of the way do it. Goes. Yeah. It was actually and harder when I'm reading it. So, and this is another <laughs> good thing for those of you who have wandered in that aren't necessarily Lutherans. Welcome. We yeah. Like to. <laughs> We're glad you're here. And and please ask questions. We're going to talk about Jesus a lot. Yeah. And, and we hope you ask us questions ask about questions, Jesus. questions. If you don't understand something, if you disagree with something, whatever, yeah. let us know. We're ha- want to hear from you. We, we, we like questions. You're welcome. But here's the thing. Um, one of the reasons Lutherans love the liturgy, and we do, mm-hmm. is because the liturgy is really us speaking scripture back and forth. Yeah. It's so much fun. If you actually look at what it is we're saying, right? one of the great things about our hymnal, the Lutheran Service Book, is it actually lists the Bible verse that it comes from in the margin over on the side. So if it's, you're following along, it's like, where is this from? Oh, that's right there. there's a Bible verse. Hey, this is a It's one of the best quote. things that we've ever done <laughs> is we finally just put the Bible passages with all the liturgical parts Yeah. so that now you can look it up. But yep. here's the thing. Every Lutheran knows 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, because it says... If you say you are without sin, you deceive, deceive yourselves, yourselves, and the, and the truth, truth is, not, is in not in us. And but if say, we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're literally quoting First John chapter 1. Yeah. I mean, like every <laughs> Lutheran knows that. Every Lutheran knows part of Matthew 28, verse 19, because we start our service in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's actually from 
Matthew yeah. 28, verse 19. And once again, if I don't think about it, it's easier for me to just say right. it because it's ingrained. It's yeah. like, here and it is. It's like, okay. See, this is, yeah. So this is the beauty then of a liturgical church is you're actually learning to speak God's word back to him. Yeah. Which, as one of our theologians says, is the best thing to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just the best you thing You didn't to do. say it in an Australian accent. I know. If, yeah. if I was cool enough, I'd say an Australian yeah. accent. I can't do that either. As our, so. as our dear sainted um, doctor of the church, Dr. Norman, Norman Nagel, yeah. uh, whom we're all blessed to have, have heard from in some way, in many and various ways. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you were in seminary with him. Yes. Okay, so on to the, the Christology, though. So you were starting to talk about how comparing this to, to John 1, and I thought that was interesting as we were talking about what are we going to do today on yeah. our episode? What are we going to talk about? And I was like, let's talk about Hebrews 1. And you were like, well, let's compare that with John 1. I was like, oh, well, that's an interesting move. Okay, what does that look like? Well, I think, you know, John 1, 1, how does it start? In the beginning was the Word. Okay, and, and we talked, we've done this, we've done this in an episode before. Yeah. We talked about what does that mean? And, and oh, by the way, commercial break. If you haven't yet... Start listening to Will Whedon's podcast. The word of the Lord endures forever. He's doing John 1, and he's doing it extremely well. It's great. Every day. Yep. What, 15 minutes? Something like About, that? About, yeah. 15, 17 minutes, something like that? Yep. But it's worth your time. It's free, so it's worth your money. Uh, <laughs> but check it out. The word of the Lord endures. Pastor Will Whedon. Um we can't come in that high enough, can we? I, I just found all you have to do: open up your podcast app yeah. and search for "the word endures," okay. and it'll show up there it as is. an option. And when you see the Pastor word Will endures, Whedon, download. Yeah, That's the, <laughs> the word endures. Org is the website, yeah. so you can find it there too. But just open up your podcast app, search for "the word of the Lord endures," and it'll show up as an option. And seriously, listen to it. I've listened to all of them each day. It's become part of my morning routine yeah. driving to work. It's great. Yeah, Will's great. Yeah. So I'm sorry, Pastor Whedon is great. So uh, <laughs> He's but, our friend, so we kind of yeah, call we're him we're Will. Yeah, we're good buddies. But um, yeah. yeah, we can't come in that high enough, can we? Just, just nope. please listen to it. It's fantastic. Yep. So anyway, when we talked about John 1 and when, when Pastor Whedon does in his podcast as well, um, the beginning of John 1 in the beginning is certainly, and some people deny this, but seriously, is an allusion to Genesis 1-1 mm -hmm. in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Well, John 1 begins, in the beginning was the word. Well, here, long ago, mm. right? Yeah. At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. This, if I mean, it kind of an obvious allusion to the Old Testament. Well, yeah, fathers is clear patriarch language. Patriarch language. So it, they would immediately prophets. hear... Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. I mean, this is what fathers is going to be when, when they hear this. And and remember, in the, in the history of the church, when you talk about the Old Testament, we refer to it as the writings of the prophets. Yeah. So the prophets of the Old Testament, the apostles of the New Testament. So we, we are a prophetic and apostolic church, meaning Old and New Testament, right? So this is explicitly alluding to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So just like John... We're going to discuss Jesus. That's the content of the book. This is a New Testament book. The content is Jesus. But we're going to do that by starting in the Old Testament. Yeah. Just like John. Yep. And by the way, just like Matthew, Mark, mm -hmm. Luke. All the Gospels. John. <laughs> they all start this way. Yeah. Okay. One of the fun things to do, if you're just looking for a fun thing to do someday, <laughs> just read the prologues to the Gospels. Just read all of them. And the prologue to Hebrews. Just read all five of those prologues. So hmm. look at the first chapter of Matthew. Read, the, read it as a prologue. Look at Mark 1 and just read his little prologue section before he gets to the ministry of John the Baptist. Read Luke 1, 1 to 4. Nice little prologue. Read John 1, 1 to 18. Nice little prologue. Read Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. And you will be amazed at the consistency and the, the unity of message, and even the way that they approach this message. See, when, when the book of Hebrews starts off, it says, this is the same God who spoke through the prophets, mm -hmm. and now he's speaking to us through his Son. And that is so enormously huge that the rest of the book has to unpack what that means. So 
since we're talking about other podcasts, I've been listening to Matt Whitman's 10 minute Bible hour podcast where he's starting to go through Matthew and he's actually making this exact same point that Matthew is intentionally pointing out that Jesus is a continuation yes. of the old Testament and saying the same kind of thing where it's like same God, same thing going on. We're just continuing this on forward. It's not anything new, but we're going to correct that because he's Ooh. not a continuation of the old okay. Testament. What is he? Fulfillment. He's a fulfillment. Of the I think old we'll Testament. get there with and that. But that, yeah, is the point of the book of Hebrews. Oh, yeah. That the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. And now that that it used to be God spoke to us through the prophets. But now in these last days... He's spoken to us... By his son. So if you want to listen to God, listen to... His son. His son. Yeah. And all of the evangelists and apostles that testify to us as eyewitnesses about his son... That's the word you should listen to. Mm. And this is really the point of the book of Hebrews is don't go looking for God apart from his son. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. You will not find him if you're not listening to his son. Or, or as we've said in past ones, don't go reading the Old Testament by doing an end run around the cross. Right. So that's, that's <laughs> where this whole thing leads is, is as he establishes this reality that Jesus is the one through whom God now speaks to us. That means when you go read the Word of God, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, don't you dare try to find God outside of Jesus there. Mm. See, don't go to Ezekiel and leave out the cross of Christ and say, oh, (laughs) this passage in Ezekiel applies to me today, or this passage in Jeremiah or Habakkuk or whatever. You you say, no, 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 no. We're going to read that through the fulfilling work of Jesus Christ, death and resurrection, his incarnation, death, resurrection, ascension, all that kind of stuff, right? The work of Christ is the fulfillment of that text. So we're going to read it that way. And it just struck me that we, we've, I think, we, I don't know if we've talked about this on this podcast, but we've had this conversation before about how people tend to read Revelation mm-hmm. in that same kind of right. way, where, you know, Revelation is very much an Old Testament sounding very book. Much. I, I thought of this when you mentioned Ezekiel. And if you read Revelation in the same way, apart from Christ, even though it's New Testament, you'd think we'd know better. Like, look, right. this is in the New Testament. You should be reading this through the lens of Jesus because, hey, how does that book start? John, the Apostle, Revelation of Jesus right. Christ. Right. <laughs> That's what it's about. Exactly. But instead, we read it, do an end run around Jesus, forget it's about him, and find Black Hawk helicopters and Russian bears. Which it is, of course. <laughs> Well, yeah, but... Russia, uh, no. in the 80s, is going to attack oh, us. Oh, but now, Wait. now we've learned better. It's now Iraq. we got to reread the whole thing It now. was Iraq. I think it's Syria the, now. The war has changed. <laughs> Therefore, a revelation... Wait. See, and that's exactly the problem, is Jesus Jesus is left behind... Wait, wait, because Jesus was left behind? Jesus gets left behind. Oh, no. Yeah, that's a whole movie franchise, <laughs> there's some, right? Yeah, there's a book series see, about that, and But that's it the whole Jesus. point of that. That whole realm of theology is kind of saying, well, the cross was good, but there's something better or more fun to focus on, and or, that's going to be the cross end times. Or the cross got us to this other thing. Right. Yeah. But, but that's not actually the point of view of the New Testament. The point of view of the New Testament is the death and resurrection of Jesus is the goal. And, and we got off on this tangent because that's what... Hebrews is telling us. Yes, that's exactly it, it, the point of so Hebrews. So it's not really a tangent. It is what Hebrews is saying. See everything through Jesus. But Listen see, here's the thing. But and, and this is the best thing ever, because the Gospel of John and Hebrews is the exact same thing. But just when you get all wrapped up in Jesus being the thing, God is not Jesus. <laughs> yeah, and okay, this is why this passage stuck out at me, because I'm like, Kevin, this is saying weird things about Jesus and yeah. confusing but me it's, again. But it's just like John 1.1. 1, 1. Yeah. In the beginning was the Word. Like, oh, okay, so you're wanting me to remember Genesis, and in the place of Elohim in the Hebrew, which means God, I'm supposed to put Jesus, so the Word. So in the beginning, Jesus created the heavens and the earth. And, and John's like, yes, but wait. <laughs> this Word was with Was with God. God. You're like, so... Wait, but my word substitute doesn't work now. So there's, there's now. a God that is with Jesus. And it's the same thing that happens here, right? Yeah. God spoke to us through his son. So there is something, some kind of conception, comes on, some kind of being, some kind of something, person, we'll say, mm-hmm. that is not the son, who speaks through the son. 
and who is God. Sounds a lot like John 1. All things were made through him. Hmm. Right? And, and it's this, yeah, exactly. And this other thing that speaks through the Son is the Father of the Son and is God. Yeah. And so we are actually brought into this very quickly, this notion that whatever this Son is, there's a Father to the Son, and that Father is God. Well, and then it's just like John, we've got he appoint, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Right. So we're immediately into creation, too. And now what we have is this son, who is not the same thing as the father, who is God, mm-hmm. is the creator. Which, if you're an Old Testament dude, you're going, ah! um, <laughs> only Yahweh gets to be called creator. Right. And you can run to Proverbs 8 and say, well, he, he created with wisdom. But, but even there, wait, wait a minute. Only Yahweh gets to say, I'm creator. And just like John 1, so also in Hebrews 1, the Son is credited with being creator. Mm-hmm. And right away, we have to stop and say, something's going on here <laughs> that is a little different than what, what you might just first think about. And this is why these are so important from a Christological point of view, because it stops us from making all the major errors. So you say, okay, well, there's one God. And we say, yes, yes, that's correct. Yep. And this one God created the world. And we say, yeah, that's correct. And we say, okay, now this one God is the father. And we say, yes. And therefore this one God is not the son. And we say, yeah, no, no, wait, nope. <laughs> no, because the things that are predicated of God are also predicated of this son. Right. Say, oh, well, the Son and the Father are the same thing. And we say, nope. No. No. One substance, Three two persons. different persons. Yeah. And they say, wait, what? what? Well, eventually three. Two Yeah, right and now. we'll, we'll yeah. be another one at some point. <laughs> Just like the Gospel of John, not as fast as you would think. Okay? So <laughs> they're less worried about Trinitarian theology than we are sometimes. Because yeah. <laughs> the focus really is Christ. And remember, the Spirit is the one that's leading us to understand this truth. Mm-hmm. The Spirit is never there to be proclaimed as Spirit. He's always there to point us to Jesus. Because remember, Jesus is the one through whom God is speaking to us to understand who he is. Mm -hmm. Same thing at the end of the prologue of the Gospel of John says is that no one has ever seen God, right? No one understands. He's he's incomprehensible to us. But the, the one who is uniquely God, the one who is in the Father's bosom, this one has made the Father known. See, you can only know God, and that's John 1, 18. You can only know God through this Jesus. And that's exactly what the prologue is saying in Hebrews and the Gospel of John. And so what John happens is... John talks about knowing, Hebrews talks about hearing. Hearing. Yeah. Yeah, which is... Yeah, John 5 talks about hearing same way. So yep. this yep. is fun. Um, so what happens is we are, we are literally stuck in this reality in which we have God, who is the Father to this Son... Right? I mean, how else would you have a son unless you're a father? Right. And they're kind of both creating, which is something only God does. I don't, I don't know if we've talked about this, but I just want to pause for a minute and talk about God as father, because this this is a, an area or a, a way of thinking where when we say everything is Christological, even this points us to Christ. The fact that he is a father, like you just said, requires him to have a son, which means his being a father is actually about Jesus. Yes. That it's not he's a father for the sake of being a father. He's a father because he's the father of Jesus. And his fatherhood is actually pointing us to Christ as well. In the same way that the Spirit has come to point us to Christ and all the work he does is to illumine Christ and all the different words around that, even this sense of God as Father is to point us to Christ. You need like a whiteboard here to, to kind yeah, of draw arrows exactly. and everything pointing. <laughs> and and what you and what happens is when you when you start to see scripture this way, you, you realize that that even in the Old Testament when God calls Israel his son, that's a prophecy of Jesus. Hmm. And that's exactly what Matthew does 
when he records the the flight of the holy family to Egypt. I will call my son up out of Egypt. Right, out of Egypt yep. I have called my son, yep. which is from Hosea. But if you look at Hosea, that is actually a reference to Israel. Yeah. And Matthew is doing this on purpose. And Matthew says, this was to fulfill. Right, this prophecy. <laughs> You're like, wait, Which, wait, that was a prophecy about Jesus? That was, was about Israel. Yeah, and we thought Jesus, that was And Israel. God is calling Israel his son. Yeah. What are you saying here? And what Matthew is saying is, all of those references to Israel as son was prophecy of Jesus, yeah. who is now the Israel of God. Which this will come up in our Matthew in five. Yes, the Bible in five for Matthew. So. Yep, very much so. So I'm, stay I'm tuned tracking. For that. Yeah, I'm tracking. I'm writing down all of the. So and this was done to fulfill. So it's yeah. like, dude, this is important for that video. Uh-huh. Yeah. So what happens in this passage is we we kind of get stuck because is this Jesus just a better prophet? Well. He's kind of more than a prophet because he's there at creation. He's the one through whom this happened, right? And, you know, he's also the heir of all things. This is not human language. But right. some people would say this is still a human, this is just a human person God chose. Okay, well, that's fine. But keep reading. Well, I think this is the next verse here. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. If I stop there, what you just said he's just well he's just an extra special guy right like he's an exact imprint i'm i'm thinking he's a copy he's a replica what does that mean radiance well he's just kind of reflecting the glory of god it's not his i read this i'm like well that i don't know what to do with that that just sounds extra special kind of guy yeah and what happens is the word that is used the exact imprint of his nature is actually the word that means substance. Oh. And this Ooh, is... creeds. We're getting some creed language here. Yes. This is... Oh, it's, it's a weird way to get to the creeds, but we'll <laughs> save that for a different episode. But what this means is that this son shares in the substance of his father. Ah, okay. Yeah, and now we're feeling very comfortable with a lot of language we've learned from Nicaea and from the Athanasian Creed. Being of one substance with the Father right. by whom all things were made. Wait, what? Hey! Hey! Wait here we are minute. in Hebrews, right? Wait, wait. <laughs> and, that's, and that's exactly what happens, is the yeah. creeds were written to reflect the language of the Holy Scriptures. Okay. So, primarily John, um, but here again, we have kind of John recapitulated in the, in the Hebrews. As we read this, we're going, this language sounds extremely familiar to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is the church. Well, once language. we framed it this way, I mean, I before I'm like, this just sounds kind of weird. But now that we're going through it, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Now, since we're talking about Greek, this is one of those those weird things that I don't understand why they chose. I mean, I, it's an okay translation. <laughs> I just kind of scratch my head when it says through whom he also created the world. It, I, I, I just, I actually told my wife I don't like this when people do this, but that's not what the Greek says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've that. told me before that Don't if somebody to ever says, says because the, I'm not going to say the Greek really says, or the Greek should be translated. So this is what the Greek says: through whom also he made the Ionas, which is usually translated as forever, oh, or eternity, or the ages. Or, like, everything? Yes. Okay. So, the translation of the world, they're they're getting at the idea that he made everything that you perceive of. Mm-hmm. Right? The world. Not meaning the earth, but, like, the universe. The entire cosmos. The entire existence. And that's, and that's the word that is often translated world is cosmos. Like, for God so loved the world. Mm-hmm. Right? But the reason I bring it up is because... That's an important word, is that it's not just that Jesus created Jesus and God together somehow, or the Son and this God created the world together, but what it means is that that the Son is actually the one through whom the entire existence of reality came into being. He made that. Hmm. He made it all. So when the ages end... It's when that same sun returns. That's the end of the ages. 
and it I'm, begins a new age. I'm having thoughts trying to remember the podcast from Will this morning because he was talking about eternity and ages and all that. And in my mind, I'm like, there's a connection here. Once mm-hmm. you've got another John one connection right, right. with Hebrews right here, exactly. And but it's, it's not coming to mind. It's well, it's, I know it's there. It's kind of the same. The same whole idea is that in in John, it's nothing has made nothing was made apart from him that has been made. Yeah. Right. It's this eternal cos cosmos idea, light and life and all these kinds of things. This is all eternal stuff. Mm-hmm. And as as one commentator said, the prologue of Hebrews moves us from creation to redemption to eternity and back to creation and redemption. Yeah, we need to get to the second half of verse three and verse right. four because I was like, oh, there's some really good stuff coming yeah, up there here. Yeah, there is. So go ahead. <laughs> So um, we haven't gotten to, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. I just want to pause there because they look we're at word, and mm-hmm. John 1 is mm-hmm. word, word and created and all that kind of stuff. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Whoa. That whole, after making purification for sins. Holy cow, there's a lot that's just wrapped up in that. So read the next 13 <laughs> chapters. Because that's really the point of the book of Hebrews. Well, and and that purification of sins, hey, that's kind of a summary of the Old Testament. Yes. Especially Moses and the law and the sacrificial system right. and the temple. All the of that. The tabernacle, the the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. I mean, this all of this stuff comes in, comes just flooding in with this one phrase. Yeah. I mean, and, and I'm not being facetious. Read the rest of the book. Right. This is what it's about. <laughs> if, if there's one phrase that needs to be unpacked in this entire book, it's that one. That yeah. After making purification for sins. So then you think of, of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, which is probably one of the verses everybody knows from Hebrews. There's a couple. Mm-hmm. But that's probably one of them. Right? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. The author and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Right. Yeah. See, and so right here we have, he's seated at the mag- the right hand of the majesty, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the whole point, is, is Hebrews 12 then recapitulates the statement for endured the cross. That's the purification for sins. Mm. And the whole book of Hebrews is saying... The entire sacrificial system, the entire priestly system, the revelation to Moses, the law of Moses, the, the, the system of priests under Aaron, the promises to Abraham, the promises to David, all of these things were fulfilled in the cross of Christ. So we intended to kind of just talk about the first few verses of Hebrews for this episode, but we've ended up giving you a summary of the entire book. Because it's it's just a rockin' book. <laughs> it's just, it's just awesome. so much fun. <laughs> because this is the book that says, look, people, the entire Old Testament is it, fulfilled in it, Christ. It's fulfilled. We did it. So don't well, go back to it. the Old Testament without Jesus. Yeah. If you're going to go back and reread the Old Testament, go back and see Jesus. Yeah. As a fulfillment of every single thing that's prophesied there. Which is what Jesus actually tells us to right. do. Which is exactly in John, what we read again. In, well, and also in Luke, which and I know Luke. is one of your favorite passages. Well, yeah. In Luke 24, I mean, he says, yep. uh, hello, the entire Old Testament scripture is written about me. And then he opened it up and showed them. And he showed it to them. Yeah. And we all wish we were there for that. <laughs> yeah. That's a podcast. <laughs> um, and again, read Mark. Same point. Mm-hmm. Read Matthew. Same point. Read Luke, the same point. What, what, as a matter of fact, read Paul. What, what I find fascinating as we're working on this Bible in Five series is the the summary statement, the nugget for each book is basically the same thing said in different ways. Shh, don't give away my secrets. They're not. Kevin, that's the whole point of the series. Oh, right. We're supposed to give away that's all the want secrets. To do. That's right. But See, it's that's... just amazing how many different ways you can talk about this same thing, and it just opens up a different facet of it and deepens it even more. And it's like, but we're talking about the same thing. So, as partly I said, as if we spend the next year doing Christology, it's not actually going to be boring because it's like, okay, here's another facet of the same amazing news. That we heard last week on the podcast, but here we are saying a slightly different way, and it's equally amazing and awesome. And and this is the fun thing, is you and I both have, have kids. Mm-hmm. 
and and the the, br- the brilliance of this this whole reality of theology is it really is a pool that is so shallow that a child can wade in it. Yeah. <laughs> and so deep that an elephant can drown. Yep. Because we can spend the rest of our lives working on Christology, reading scripture, and we will never run out of things to talk about. We'll never run out of mysteries to mm-hmm. to explore and to, and to look how the churches handle things and how do we talk about this in our lives and how do we learn to trust in Christ with our very being, right? We'll never run out of that. Yep. On the other hand, you can go home and your cute little daughter can say, you know, it's all about Jesus and the fact that he loves us and that, that he died for us. And you're like, yep, that's, yeah. that's it. We're, we're going through the book of Judges as a family. And yeah. Judges never mentions Jesus. Right. I don't think it mentions the word Savior specifically anywhere in this in the sense that we're talking about. And yet, it's just awesome to be able to show my kids in every chapter, hey, guys, here's how this is pointing to Jesus. Right. Here's what's happening to the to the Israelites in this time, that's actually about Jesus, and it's reminding them and pointing them forward to, hey, there's this yeah. promise that God made, it's going to be fulfilled, but it's not yet. Right. Okay, here's a little glimpse of it, and every but judge, it's not yet. every judge is a little type of Christ, mm-hmm. and and this this refrain that that gets summarized then in chapter 19, right, where everyone did whatever they wanted, it was right in their own eyes because they had no <laughs> king, right, because they had no king, yeah. And that leads obviously to to first and second Samuel and, and the whole monarchy, but but more so, it leads to Pilate looking at Jesus and saying, "So, are you a king?" Mm. Right? Yeah. And it leads to the confession of of Palm Sunday, right? Mm-hmm. Blessed is the King of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right. And yeah. it's it's he's our king. Behold your king. This is him enthroned on a cross with a crown of thorns. This is our king, the one who defeats death and the devil. This is our king, the one who, according to the book of Hebrews, sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is your king. No one can defeat him. He's defeated all enemies. He's defeated sin, death, and devil on your behalf. This is your king. He will come again with glory. And you, because you've been baptized into him, because you've received the faith handed down through the word, because you eat his very body and drink his very blood, when he shows up, as king, <laughs> mm-hmm. you're in him. And, and this you. is a big theme in Matthew. Huge. That's that's like one of his, the, we'll talk about this in the Bible. That's right. Five for that again. Huge yeah. theme in Matthew. So here in Hebrews, we have this, the purification of sins is the the huge theme, the the high priest. Mm-hmm. That's all, all in Hebrews, the high priestly language, the line of Melchizedek, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You, Only you, in Hebrews is Jesus called a priest. Hmm. Isn't that weird? Yeah, but when he is, like that's the whole point of the He's middle like section the of the book, one. Yeah. right? <laughs> it's so cool. It's great. Um, I know John seventeen is a high priestly prayer, but it doesn't say that in the text. That's what we that's just what that's we the call editorial it. Editorial right. comment. That's, that's what we call, and that's fine. I'm not saying that's a bad name. I'm just right. saying in the text itself, Jesus has priest is a Hebrews idea, hmm. which is kind of fun. Yeah, but yeah, all of this. You're right, and and the more we talk about it, the more you do see that the New Testament is certainly a collection of 27 books but they're all inspired by the same Holy Spirit. And all of these apostles and writers of the New Testament Scripture were writing about the same gospel. There's only one gospel, mm. and it's the story of Jesus. Yeah. Right? And that story is the crucial conversation. That's what we're here for. That's what we're doing. If you're just joining us, if you've been listening for a while, we'd love to have your questions. We'd love to hear from you. If you have ideas of where we can go with future episodes on Christology, things you've wanted to understand, things you've wanted to ask about, send those in. Questions at crucialproductions.org is the email address, or go to our website, fill out the Ask a Question form. It's right there at the top of the page, crucialproductions.org. We'd love to hear from you. would love your feedback and we'd like to interact with you a little bit here on yeah, our absolutely. podcast. <laughs> absolutely. So, Thanks again, and we'll see you guys next time. See ya.